Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome today to this afternoon session called We Put the POR in Important and Why These Patient Partners and Researchers Are Championing Patient Oriented Research, or POR, in Saskatchewan. Um, my name is Michelle Flowers. I'm a patient engagement specialist with the Saskatchewan Centre for Patient Oriented Research, officially known as SCIPA, and I'll be moderating today's session. So before I begin, I'd just like to take a moment to recognise the traditional lands that we're all meeting on today. Um, I'm calling you and joining you from my backyard office in Saskatoon, which is located in Treaty 6 territory, and it's the homeland of the Métis people. And when I was taught about traditional land acknowledgements, I was taught to connect to the land. So as my Australian default of um, the warm weather is actually playing a big part today as I'm sitting here in the storm that we're experiencing here in Saskatoon. So that's how I'm seeing and sort of living in the weather that we're experiencing and connecting to the land. All right, so we've got a couple of the housekeeping, uh, I guess, um, details before we begin. We've got two 20 minute presentations that'll be part of this session and each session will have time for questions and answers at the end. Um, I'll be monitoring those. So if you put your questions in the chat, which you find in the lower right hand side of your screen, um, you'll be able to engage with the other participants as well as have them pop up and I'll be feeding them out to the teams at the end. So now to begin, I'm going to introduce our first speakers, We've got Dr. Sarah Donkers and our patient partner, Elizabeth Peace. So Dr. Sarah Donkers is an assistant professor in the School of Rehabilitation Science at the University of Saskatchewan. Previously, she worked clinically as a physiotherapist for over 10 years in the area of neurocare. And it was that clinical work that actually led her to pursue research. Sarah's research focuses on improving access to and the quality of rehabilitation interventions that promote neuro recovery and optimizing function for people with neurological conditions. Her work takes a community engaged participatory approach that involves multiple stakeholders and those teams include individuals living with multiple sclerosis, their family members, researchers, healthcare providers and decision makers in the, um, in the Saskatchewan Health Authority and of course the MS Society of Canada. And our patient partner Elizabeth Peace, she's a patient partner volunteer with the SHA, with SCIPA and with Health Quality Council. And in November 2018, Elizabeth was hospitalised with an aneurysm or a hemorrhagic stroke, and she was discharged from hospital in February 2019. During the, her stroke recovery or her journey, she received medical intervention from numerous SHA services, including the EMT team, IUH emergency, ICU, surgical and neurological departments, and of course, City Hospital Rehabilitation Services. Before she retired, Elizabeth worked with the Saskatchewan Medical Association, regularly engaging with physician executives, and multiple healthcare stakeholders in various projects. And I guess, welcome Sarah and Elizabeth, and over to you. Fantastic, thank you, Michelle. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for being here. As Michelle said, I'm Sarah. Uh, I am a physiotherapist turned researcher, and my expertise are in neurological rehab. And I've always taken uh, a patient-oriented approach to my research. So I was thrilled when uh, Skipper, or the Saskatchewan uh, Centre for Patient-Oriented Research was first established. Uh, they have been a wonderful resource of support for me and my research team. So my understanding is that we have a bit of a mixed audience here today. So if I say anything, like any terms you're not familiar with, or if you have any questions at all, please be sure to ask them either today or feel free to uh, email me afterwards. So my goal today is to briefly share what uh, I have learned from taking a patient-oriented approach and answer any questions I can. So I want to start off by emphasizing that patient-oriented research really is an approach to research. So it has theoretical or philosophical underpinnings, uh, and they are informing key principles. And these key principles of a patient-oriented approach uh, can, Sorry. but basically I want to emphasize that patient-oriented research is an approach to research. So these, um, these key principles can be applied across different types of research, uh, and it's a very good fit for clinical work and research in partnership with health systems um, and healthcare providers. So as an approach to research, um, hopefully you can see my second slide now, <laughs> as an approach to uh, research, it has similarities with other engaged approaches that you may be familiar with, such as integrated knowledge translation, participatory action research, participatory health research, or community engaged research. Um, and there really is more overlap than these circles show, but ultimately they all share this idea of engaging 
um, engagement with uh, our stakeholders and ultimately this idea that the research uh, process is striving to impact positive change. So poor or patient-oriented research, often called poor, um, uniquely targets patient identified priorities and works to support patients in meaningful engagement as part of the research team from the beginning, but also throughout all phases of research. So to me and my re research team, these are some of the key components, but also the benefits of good patient-oriented research. So it empowers our uh, patient partners, it empowers their voice, and it, it strives to integrate it throughout all phases of the research process. It focuses on outcomes and outcome measures that are meaningful to community members. There's also a reciprocity of learning. So it is a two-way learning between patient partners and researchers. And when done well, so when our patient partners are engaged in meaningful ways, um, so these are ways that create a safe, oh, sorry, I just got, <laughs> now I can't see it. <laughs> okay, there we go. Um, so on to the next slide, Shanae. There we go. Okay, so these are um, some of the key components of, of good, but also some of the benefits of patient-oriented research. So I mentioned already, it empowers the patient voice uh, and it strives to integrate it throughout all phases of the research process. It focuses on outcomes and outcome measures and using these measures that are meaningful and relevant to our community members. Uh, there is a reciprocity of learning. So it's a two-way learning between our patient partners and researchers. And when done well, when our patient partners, so to me, our patient partners are engaged in meaningful ways. So these are ways that create safe learning spaces, create relationships that mitigate power, uh, differentials, and um, uh, when this happens, this is when patient-oriented research can lead to meaningful and relevant impact that is more likely to sustain the changes and result in this um, integration of diverse perspectives uh, to inform the compact complex health solutions that we're working with. So next slide. Um, okay, so briefly some of uh, the patient-oriented research teams and projects that I'm involved with. Uh, we have our Sprout Grant, which was jointly funded by the Saskatchewan Health Research Foundation and the Saskatchewan Center for Patient-Oriented Research. Uh, it also made MS Research Milestones as uh, the largest rehab uh, grant in MS to date. Uh, we did have four patient partners representing uh, urban and rural perspectives, as well as a range of severity from MS symptoms. Um, another project was our MS Care Pathway Creation Implement Implementation and Evaluation Project. So this had a few sub-projects that came out of it, but um, I just wanted to highlight it as an example of a more diverse team in terms of the range of stakeholders. So we had representatives from the MS Society, the Health Authority, the Ministry, multidisciplinary healthcare providers, researchers, and of course, people living uh, with MS from across the province. And then a more recent initiative is our NeuroSask Active and Connected. So this is a virtual knowledge mobilization platform for individuals with neurological conditions. And it was built off of existing relationships, but then expanded to include other neurological conditions. Um, and it's an example of partnerships with healthcare providers again, community-based organizations and individuals living with neurological conditions. So we actually had patient partners inform this grant as well as the program, its contents and the evolution of the program. So there really is a snowball effect in patient-oriented research. Uh, I think, I often think of it as a program of research. So it's made up of some of these different studies and grants, but really there's a lot going on between those studies and behind the scenes to effective patient-oriented research. So um, nourishing the relationships and continuing to commit to that positive change so that we can um, apply the knowledge generated to improve healthcare systems and practice. So my main message today is to get involved in patient-oriented research. Uh, Skipper is a wonderful resource to help support this. Um, and if you are considering being a patient partner, uh, just keep in mind that you don't have to know anything about research. Uh, that is our role. That's part of us as researchers because um, we want to help share that knowledge and we value uh, the knowledge that you bring from your lived experience as well as your honest and open opinions. So like I said, it's a two-way learning process. Um, so patients are wonderful advocates of meaningful change. 
which leads perfectly into telling you about my work with Elizabeth. So Elizabeth, who you will hear from in a moment, she is a patient advocate. She has passion and tenacity, uh, and she has a very evident desire to take her experience of recoming, recovering from her hemorrhagic stroke uh, and her drive to continue to recover. So take this experience and use it to advocate for health services that support neural recovery even after discharge. So my partnership with Elizabeth is a great example of a really early partnership in patient-oriented research, um, and it's also an example of a patient-identified priority. So Elizabeth and a few other members from her stroke survivor group uh, came to me. We initially met through our NeuroSask program um, and also from last year. So at this exact time during the Saskatchewan Health Research Showcase, Elizabeth attended a presentation that our MS team did um, and this included partners with lived experience. And after that, she reached out and she was like, we need to do this for stroke rehab. Um, so it's taken a little bit of time to figure out where to start and to really narrow in her ambition into one project. But we are now starting to write a grant to pilot a self-management support program. Um, and this program is co-designed. So not just the grant, but the intervention is co-designed by uh, individuals with lived experience. So over to you, uh, Elizabeth. One of the most meaningful pieces of my rehab has been the involvement with SHA on the Skipper Patient Oriented Opportunities. During recovery, I searched for information about stroke research in our province. I found pockets, but most of it is not patient oriented research. I have experienced many opportunities as a patient advisor with the SHA Skipper and Saskatchewan Stroke Pathway but these were general advisor roles and not specific projects. However, I was part of a research project with fourth year U of S kinesiology students. And I'm now supporting a research project for arterial spin labeling imaging protocol for acute stroke. And this will, the outcome of this will be a first for Sakashian. And I must tell you, if you go to the poster hall, you'll find a poster by the lead researcher on this. His name is Mandru and he's a second year med student at uh, U of S. It's well worth the visit. Going forward, Dr. Donkers, myself and a fellow hemorrhagic stroke patient, will partner on a research project for developing community-based programs to continue to support stroke recovery and brain health after hospital discharge. I am a patient partner because of a by chance opportunity. I've since applied for opportunities with patient oriented research committees, working groups and pathways. All of this activity has helped me improve and bolstered my resolve to advocate for improved stroke services and rehab in Saskatchewan. I am confident patient partners have a powerful tool in their possession. It is their patient lived experience. They can influence so much. My patient partner experiences with SHA, Skipper, and HQC have been positive, with the exception of one or two. It's important to remember that effective researcher patient partner relationships must be genuine and valued in, over, in order to overcome tokenism. I'm going to uh, show you a slide now of a a container ship known as the Evergreen, and it got stuck sideways in the Suez Canal. And it veered off course in uh, March of 2021. And I think of the ship as our healthcare system stuck in pandemic times. The containers are full of research projects and health services waiting to be delivered. The diggers and front end loaders are researchers. And the tugs, you guessed it, are patient partners doing what we do best adding value, experience, power, strength, and steering patient-oriented research in the right direction. I'll just leave you to watch a couple of these videos. Shanae, you can go to the next slide. ربما يعني تبتعد السفينة قليلا عن منظرنا هو أمر جيد يعني
Um, and I hope with that resounding finish that uh, you will become involved with patient-oriented research and toot your horn. Thanks so much for the opportunity again. Great, thanks Elizabeth, thanks for sharing that. Um, lots of great insight in there and you shared some of your uh, numerous roles that you've had in patient-oriented research. So both generally as an advisor for uh, Skip, Skipper and the Health Authority, but then more focused patient partner role in acute at the acute stroke pathway and then even more specific partnering on research grants or research projects and now partnering on research grants. So a wealth of experience. Um, while we wait to see if there's any questions from the audience, I might throw a few your way because uh, you mentioned most of your experiences were good, um, but then a few felt like tokenism. So could you elaborate on what good patient-oriented research means to you? Well, definitely it has to be uh, pertinent and appropriate for Saskatchewan Health initiatives. I, there's no point in kind of doing something for the rest of the world, although that would be lovely. But the relationships need to be respectful and trusted, and they have to actually be partnerships, relationships that become partnerships. There has to be recognition of values and lived experience for every team member. Good communication, I think that kind of goes without saying with all of this. And uh, the facilitators, um, it would be helpful if they were quite knowledgeable and uh, comfortable with the role of research. Great. Um, I see Michelle popped on. Is there questions from the audience? No, and thank you. I wanted to say a special thank you to both Dr. Sarah Donkers and Elizabeth Peace. That was an amazing story, Elizabeth. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, yeah, everybody, just a reminder, pop your questions in the chat. I'm looking at some comments, just thanking you for sharing your story, such an inspiring story and fantastic to see that the partnership was actually initiated with by Elizabeth, which is fantastic. Not always possible with patient-oriented research, but so good to see these examples and, yeah, and what a patient partner can do. Um, and yeah, another comment about it, an impressive illustration highlighting the important role patient partners play in healthcare research. So if anybody does have any questions, but um, yeah, I think a question for you, Dr. Donk, is like, you know, hearing about the impact that patient partners could have on patient oriented research teams. What's your experience? What has been, what has stood out from you, the difference between say traditional research and having a patient partner there on your team? What's been the impact? Yeah, great question. Um, so I love research, all forms of research, but I was a clinician first um, and it was my clinical work that led me to research. So I think I, I naturally didn't know any other way besides patient-oriented research. Um, and so I got really interested in all forms of engaged research um, and, and there's challenges, but I think the strengths are having that immediate motivation and for me a team to help support you through some of the challenges of research so sometimes they're slow sometimes you have a, a lot of excitement to put a grant together and it's not funded but little projects and and partnerships and support um, to keep things moving and just feeling like um my efforts, I think all health research, you know, is striving to make change, but having that team, um, I feel reinforces um, my, my efforts uh, and, and sort of speeds up the meaningful uptake of some of the results. Yeah, that's fantastic. And how about you, Elizabeth? What's been the most impactful part of being part of these research teams for you personally? It's uh, been the connections. So, uh, and the fact that when I emailed or phoned somebody and said what's happening with stroke in the province, that there wasn't an immediate click, that uh, the seed was planted, so to speak, and that uh, uh, Dr. Dunkers mentioned it kind of took a, a while to get um, to get growing, but it's happening, and I, I just I, I it's the reception. I was I've been really pleased with the positive reception. And actually, I have a question for Dr. Donkers, if you have a moment, and that was, uh, actually, how do you, it's two parts, how do you involve stakeholders, like patient partners, like me, I mean, I phoned you, but normally, uh, how, how would this happen, and um, how do you invite, basically, how do you invite them onto the team? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, I think it depends on the size and the scope of the project, right? Like, 
um, we've given examples that are like true, fully engagement, but you have to keep in mind that patient-oriented research is sort of a spectrum. And, and I think really good patient-oriented research engages patient partners in a way that's meaningful to them. Not everybody wants to be a decision maker. Not everybody wants to learn about um, certain methods or be involved in the data analysis, but um, empowering them to make those choices on how they wanna be involved is really important. Um, so I look at the scope of the project, um, the intervention, and I try to choose teams that are representative of the diverse perspective that we are investigating. Um, and then you just ask, right? Um, uh, I use, um, I use the definition of patient loosely, right? So, so patient is someone with lived experience, but it's also their loved ones, their, um, caregivers. Um, it's the individuals who are going to be using the outputs of your research and your end knowledge. So often I'll look to healthcare providers to help me find that uh, patient advocate. And I mean, I've been fortunate. I haven't had to go too far uh, looking for, for patient partners. Um, often they have found me or I've had networks through my clinical, clinical practice. Um, so, so if you are at all interested, look. Um, there's things like the... Uh, platform and skipper to help researchers find patients and to help patients find researchers um, in in an area. Um, so yeah, I don't I don't have a strict screening criteria, uh, but I really look to engage, empower people to be engaged in the way they want. So don't feel like you have to have knowledge of research to do patient oriented research. I think we've got time for maybe a quick question we have from Yvonne Hansen. So thank you both for your stories and thank you especially to Elizabeth because it does take courage to share that and the energy to tell your own story. But how can researchers promote diverse individuals, patients, partners, their families, etc., um, to get involved in patient-oriented research and do you engage with community groups? Uh, is that for Dr. Douglas and myself? You oh, take <laughs> Could be both. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, I guess it just comes from the heart. It comes from inside that you want to make change. Uh, and and that, that, I think that's what drives it. This has got to change. This has got to make it better for health and for the people of Saskatchewan. It's just, it's internal. I don't know if I can, I don't know, Dr. Donkers, can you elaborate on that at all? That's, that's where it comes from, internal, right? Mm -hmm. Got to happen. Yeah, and being as open and transparent on why, why you're looking for patient partners and, and what roles can they fill and what information. So um, the very first thing we do is often talk about, um, about research process, but then why we want them part of the team, but also why they want to be part of the team. So you, you have those conversations and we've learned you have to revisit them throughout um, because as things evolve um, and we work with individuals with neurological conditions, like as their states evolve or fluctuate, we have to be flexible. Um, but just doing your best as a researcher to learn more about the approach and the methods and, and good ways of engagement and just checking yourself every now and then, like checking yourself um, to see if, sorry, <laughs> to see if um, you are using patients as tokenism. Right, and then, and how? What can you do about that? Well, it sounds like it's it's real life here. This is what you get when you come to patient-oriented research. Phones are ringing and slides are working, and people will put participatory in their introduction, and it's hard mm -hmm. to say. But thank you so much, Dr. Sarah Donkers and Elizabeth Pease. It's been a great presentation today. Yeah. If anybody does have any more questions, you can still send them through to us, and we'll be passing them along. And I guess now we'll move on to our second presentation. And so I'd like to introduce Dr. Barb Fornsler and patient partner, partner Marie Adjuridis. And so Dr. Barb Fornsler is the principal investigator for the P5 project here in Saskatoon and is an adjunct faculty member in the School of Public Health at the University of Saskatchewan. Dr. Fornsler is also the knowledge translation and exchange coordinator for the Prairie Node of the Canadian Research Initiative for Substance Misuse or PRISM. Dr. Fawns has been working in substance use research since 2011, and she teaches the course Studies in Addictions um, at both the School of Public Health and the Department of Sociology. And when she's not in the classroom, Barb enjoys camping and hiking adventures alongside her partner and their two dogs, a four-year-old Great Dane named Opal and a six-year-old Lab named Cal. 
and patient partner. We have Maria Adjuridis here today from Saskatoon. She's married with five children and she was a manager with the Saskatchewan Crown Corporation and has just recently retired. In 2015, Marie lost her 19-year-old son, Kelly, to a fentanyl overdose. Marie's voice has been heard across Canada and has inspired changes to federal laws as they relate to substance use and addiction. And Marie hopes to soften the judgments and to educate on the realities of recovery in Canada and ultimately to encourage the spoken voice of families that are too afraid to share. So welcome to Barb and Marie and over to you. Hi everyone, thank you so much for, for being here today and for having us and, and uh, giving us this opportunity to share some of the work that we've been doing and importantly focus in on, on this, uh, this concept of patient-oriented research. Um, Marie, thank you so much for joining today. I'm gonna put our presentation up and, uh, and hope it works uh, for us. Let's see if I can go into presentation mode. Oh, let's see. There we go. There you go. Two years in, you think we'd have it all cased by now, right? But <laughs> still a learning engagement every time. Um, so we, uh, yeah, really briefly, hopefully everyone can see uh, the slide there on the screen. And, um, and we decided to uh, steal the poor and importance for our, our title today. Uh, thank you <laughs> to the folks. There we go, Michelle. Thank you. Um, so the importance of patient partners in community-based health research or patient-oriented research. Um, my background is largely in uh, participatory action research, community-based research, depending on the, on the mode. But, um, but yeah, this is certainly a compliment. We we're hoping to share a little bit of our reflection from the, uh, the P5 project, as, as Michelle mentioned in our introduction here. And the P5 project stands for the perspectives, pathways, and priorities of people with lived and living experience of substance use informing policies. That's a mouthful. So P5 project YXE has become our, our acronym. Um, what we're going to share today uh, with all of you who have so kindly joined us over, over lunch here um, is really who we are and, and what brought us into this work. Uh, a really brief summary of the P5 Project YXE and of course I'm going to encourage you all to visit our project website to learn more. Um, we're also going to talk about the patient-oriented approach that we engaged in the P5 project as we've, as we've moved forward and this project is not yet complete. Uh, we are still in process so it's great to be able to share a little bit about where we're at. And then uh, just some of the benefits and challenges uh, that Marie and I have discussed and, uh, and wanted to share with all of you today, leaving a lot of time for questions and discussion because I think that's our favorite part of, uh, of engaging presentations is getting to speak to so many different people and hear different perspectives. You already heard our bios, <laughs> which is great, but, um, but who are we and what brings us to this work? Um, you know, I've, I've been working in substance use research since 2011, um, but I would say that what motivates a lot of my work is uh, a commitment to social justice and equity um, in, in the world. Um, so that's, that's a big part of my motivation. Um, certainly my lived experience uh, growing up uh, faced challenges around substance use uh, in my family and, uh, and certainly had, had my own party times in my, uh, in my 20s and was very lucky to, uh, to be able to continue and come into this field of work and research um, where, yeah, I often say I'm an advocate who got a hold of some credentials and became Dr. Fornsler and now tries to work from that perspective. And, uh, and yes, uh, one of the most important things I think about me is that I, I do love dogs and, uh, and enjoy a lot of camping and hiking. So I often leave it there because I've got a bunch of bios online and things like that. So if you want to know more about my research methods and all that stuff, you can find me online or on the P5 Project website. Uh, but Marie, um, as we we're talking about who we are, I certainly should stop talking. <laughs> That's no problem. Thanks, Barb. Hey, everybody. Uh, you heard what uh, Michelle had to say about what my background is. And just even further to that, uh, we have another son who had started this path of recreational drug use that turned into a very invested uh, addiction to OxyContin until it turned into fentanyl and heroin. And then um, uh, the biggest shock of our lives is when, in fact, that that boy who I thought would die has not, and he's actually been in recover, recovery for a number of years, but the other son, who we never expected, was using at that level, which he wasn't, but he died when fentanyl kind of came into the picture. And then, so what happened is, is when Kelly had died, I thought, what is going on? I had two girlfriends who don't live blocks from me by the university, both lost their kids within the same six month period that we lost Kelly. <clears throat> and I knew that it was time 
for the voice of the families to start being heard. Too many because it's so stigmatized and stifling and everybody believes that substance use or any of its, uh, any of the, the detrius around it is, is they look at the family as what's wrong with the family. And in our silence, we perpetuate that. And it was time to start opening up. And I was doing it for my son, my son who was pretty darn amazing. The one that we lost, he was amazing. I can't even, won't even get into it. Miss him every second and every minute of every day, as you can well imagine at 19 years old, can him, losing a child, he felt like he was a baby. Anyhow, so that led me to a lot of advocacy work. It led me to be part of the start of a national organization called Mom Stop the Harm. For 16 of us were on board. We met in Kelowna in 2017. And now we have thousands of people across the country who are lending their voices to this arena of substance use and addictions where, where most particularly uh, narcotics are involved. And then I was fortunate enough to be able to secure a position of helping teach uh, with Skipper through teaching how to work with patient partners uh, on your projects. And now I am part of three research projects myself. And what a great education and learning experience it has been. So, yeah, that is me. And thanks so much for joining us today. Awesome. Thank you, Marie. Trying to... There we go. So I, I often, uh, the project that, that we're sort of focusing on and reflecting on today is that P5 project. And I always, always am sure to try and state that not all substance use is problematic. Um, this is a term that we're still trying to find our language in the field of substance use research. Let's, let's be clear about that. There's not a consistent use of term terminology. Often the terminology is highly stigmatizing for people who do use drugs or other substances and, uh, and their family members as Marie mentioned in that introduction, um, that stigma and the silence that perpetuates that stigma is a huge barrier in this work. So I do wanna just note that yes, my work and my research area of expertise is around when substance use becomes problematic in some way for, for individuals, their family and community. And that problematic word is itself problematic. So. Um, so hopefully you can bear with us as we find better language to express these ideas. Um, and part of how we're doing that is by talking to people, right? And that's, that's really the heart of patient-oriented research is hearing from people. But a really brief summary of this project, um, we are basically seeking to understand the perspectives, pathways, and priorities of people with lived and living experience of substance use here in Saskatoon. Um, and as the services in Saskatoon connect more broadly to the province of Saskatchewan. So our, our driving research questions are what do the perspectives of people with lived and living experience of problematic use reveal about the current nature of harm reduction or recovery services in Saskatchewan? What are the actual pathways that folks are traveling as they navigate harm reduction and recovery services? And what are the priorities of people who are accessing these program services and what policy changes would they like to see? So this is um, not, in a sense, um, it's, it's a new kind of inquiry for Saskatchewan. These kinds of inquiries have been happening in, in places like British Columbia and Vancouver uh, with the leadership of people like Dr. Jane Buxton and others who have really established in the research world the value and the importance of the voices of lived experience, not just informing policy, but basically, you know, we talk about inviting people to the table. Um, it's not about, <laughs> about us researchers inviting people to the table, but instead now it's really about us being asked as researchers to come to the table of people who use substances. Our community partners in this project in Saskatoon are uh, community-based partners are out Saskatoon and Prairie Harm Reduction. And they've been wonderful collaborators throughout this entire process. So I wanna give a huge, you know, huge hat tip and acknowledgement. Um, to be blunt, our project would not have gone forward without these partnerships and without, also you'll see on the, on the team roster side there, um, we have a 10 member advisory board of people with lived and living experience of substance use. Um, not all of whom are comfortable being named as such, um, and not all of whom are comfortable sort of stepping, stepping forward at this time, but they do want to be involved and they do want their voice to influence what is happening in this area of research, um, how this research is being conducted, and the outcomes that we're, we're hoping to, uh, to muster. So that is an extensive list of individuals, but... Um, but really what we're pursuing is an understanding in this project of what's, what's actually happening, right? We have a lot of, uh, 
we have a lot of ideas about how pathways work within our health system and how people find those pathways, right? And so we have a lot of these great ideas. We have a lot of, of analytic thoughts around that, but what actually happens for folks as they're pursuing uh, you know, accessing services is often quite divergent from, from the model that we might have in mind um, about our health system. And further to that, um, as was noted in the prior presentation as well, um, patient is a, is a word that, that we're often sort of uh, in the community context, sometimes folks have not yet become patients. Uh, maybe they never will be patients formally within our formal health system. Um, and that's okay. We really want to talk to people who are most impacted by the policies and regulations and pathways that are set up now. And we want those voices informing uh, what will make better pathways, more barrier-free pathways going forward. So our key research questions, of course, our website is there. I encourage you all to, uh, to read more in detail about this project, um, because today we're really trying to focus on what is a patient-oriented research approach and how did we embed that in uh, the P5 project YXE? So this is a lot of text on a slide. <laughs> Thank you for bearing with me. Um, but really what, uh, and what Marie pointed out when we were speaking, uh, doing a, a test run of this presentation was that this is sort of like a, a bunch of flag posts <laughs> in the project process uh, that show where we've engaged our, 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 um, our patient family advisors, our patient advisors and our, our advisory board as well. So right at the beginning, thanks to, uh, to the patient engagement and development award uh, that, that Skipper provided there, um, we were able to have conversations about what research would be meaningful for people here in Saskatoon. So, um, so we engaged with, with individuals who shared their perspectives, their priorities and their pathways is what was emphasized, right? They're like, we want our voices acknowledged. Um, we want our perspectives valued. We want our priorities to be reflected in the systems that we see and we want our pathways to be made easier. And we know that that can happen through policy change. So you'll, you see it in the title, Perspectives, Pathways and Priorities of People with Lived and Living Experience Informing Policies. Our application for this funding um, that we received, thanks again to the Saskatchewan Health Research Foundation and Saskatchewan Center for Patient-Oriented Research for making this possible and for valuing the role of patients within the research process. I often say things don't take off in research unless there's funding attached. And, um, and I think this is a great opportunity to attach some funding to the voices of lived experience and in integrating these experiences in the research process. So right from the application. Um, so before the application, as we were writing the funding application, um, our, one of our patient advisors on the project, Brandy Abel, as, as I was talking to her about our project design and things said, will you own it as a research design error if your recruitment approach fails? Or will you simply conclude that certain groups of people don't use drugs? And, um, and I'm so grateful for that accountability. Um, I think we're often tempted as researchers to say, oh no, I do perfect project design every time. And, uh, and what with my training and so on and so forth, I, I could not possibly have made this error. Well, it turns out, no, um, sometimes there are errors in study design. We make certain assumptions um, about the process that may or may not be true. So that accountability to community and to uh, my collaborators on this project started right there in the application writing. Will you own it as your error as a researcher? And yes, yes, I will. Um, and that was a really important conversation to have right at the outset. Our funding uh, was awarded from the Sprout Grant in uh, the start of March 2020, and we were shut down by the pandemic a, a week later. So we proceeded, though, uh, with building additional relationships and new pathways, anticipating some major changes due to the pandemic. We really weren't sure what was going to happen um, or what would be possible. But we had this opportunity because we'd received this funding award. And it was an opportunity to have what has been uh, seen as a very important conversation for quite some time in this province. So we continued building relationships, talking to each other, figuring out routes. Um, how do we move this forward? We uh, onboarded more advisors to our, to our advisory board and began some community engagement, um, joining the Crystal Meth Working Group of the Safer Community Action Alliance here in Saskatoon. And of course, working with Out and PHR um, for information sessions and training around conducting research, um, basically finding ways to connect and converse as a team and do some of that, uh, you know, they call it team building a lot of the time, but uh, really getting to know each other and trying to share information and knowledge that we brought to the table as a team. 
In our ethics application development, we again were involving uh, patients and, and patient partners within the project. So uh, not just our interview guide, but the overall approach uh, was approved, uh, reviewed and approved by advisors and community partners. Uh, we filed our ethics application in August 2020, and many conversations were held across the team and with the, uh, with the ethics board regarding participant safety and research conduct, especially during COVID. Approval was granted in February 2021, and we did weekly training and development during that wait and during the conversation. Uh, during our recruitment process, again, uh, patient partners were, were a huge part of that success. I really, we would not have succeeded in our data collection without all the wonderful people involved. Um, so uh, knowledge ambassadors were individuals uh, who were partnered with the research team and working at the community organizations uh, that we were that were partnered with. And, um, and basically these folks hold expert knowledge in both how that community organization is working and in research processes, right? So they're a wonderful uh, translator, if you will, and, and, and assistant to, to helping different worlds communicate with each other. And that has been wonderful. So a um, whole bunch of feedback received about recruitment, uh, not the least of which was Marie's suggestion, like, no, don't start with collecting demographic information. You need to have a conversation with people, get to know them first before you start asking, you know, what's your age? When, when do you start using substances? This kind of stuff, right? And, and that really that demography wasn't the most important part of the conversation we were having. Thank you again for that, Marie. It was, it was a good, it was a wonderful contribution and and it reflected well in the interviews. So, um, so all of these things to say that uh, really our advisory board helped us with recruitment and with getting people into the project, interested in the project, following it. Uh, they shared posters, you know, recruitment posters and advertising materials. They tapped friends on the shoulder in that snowball sampling kind of role and said, hey, get in touch with this team if you wanna to talk to folks about your experience. We just concluded our data collection period November 1st, so I don't have a lot of findings to share here with the team, with, uh, with everyone who's joined us today, but we are now engaging or starting to engage um, what will be our, our analysis, and, uh, and we will continue to do that with our, our team and all our patient partners, um, and really aiming to produce a technical report and summary no later than February 2022. Our project guiding elder, Joanna Saddleback, and I had an opportunity to chat about sort of what, what should this look like and, and what's, what are the key sort of things that we need to think about when we are sharing about the outcomes of this project. And her message uh, to me the other week was to continue working in solidarity. Um, so report consultation will be on, on, ongoing and underway as we as we get into data analysis. And really the aim uh, for, in the words of Elder Saddleback, is to emphasize relationships beyond the project time frame. And I think that, that really resonates with me because I, um, as, as was mentioned by, by Sarah earlier, um, patient-oriented research is more about a, a program than a specific project, right? And I think when I hear Joanne speak about the relationships that carry on, that exist before a project and continue after a project, um, it really reflects that relationship and that connection that goes on between people. And for me, that's the foundation of patient-oriented work. We're of course gonna get into knowledge translation and exchange efforts as well. Um, one thing I advise all researchers to ask is how many hidden artists or creators are on your team? Um, it's been a wonderful surprise, I guess, that uh, so many people involved with our team are musicians and painters and other creators on the side, in a sense. Uh, they wear their, their, their job hat into our meetings a lot of the time, but so much talent underlying uh, and, and backing so many people. So be sure to ask, you know, what, what do people do? Call it a hobby. Sometimes folks aren't, aren't comfortable saying I'm an artist, but they might say, oh yeah, I paint as a hobby. And it turns out they have a whole lot of talent to share. Um, so KTE can mean so much more than an infographic. It can mean friendships, events, teaching, ceremony, collaboration with other research teams who are doing similar, similar work at this time or connected work. It can mean a whole lot of things, but foundationally it means relationships. Marie, I've talked a lot on this slide like we knew I would. Do you have some additions or thoughts to add? Um, just a couple things. I think that importantly, when you look at the flow of this, uh, as a patient partner, my experiences have varied. Uh, in with Barb's group, I was given an opportunity to be engaged at every level of this, uh, uh, even if it's just part of the discussion, what ideas do you have? And that's really important. 
it's really important that um, you feel included as a patient partner. And some people aren't as vocal as let's say I am. I'm a little bit fearless and sometimes that gets me in trouble. However, often people are shy and somewhat intimidated by uh, persons who have the, the accreditation that many of you do when it comes to doing this kind of work and don't think that what we have to say has real value. So by even using this as a template, and also looking and taking it that uh, those courses through Skipper that that you know, the introduction to patient oriented research where we can give you ideas on how to work effectively with a patient partner because they really need to be valued. And as Barb had mentioned, there are things that we add that sh that even came as a surprise to her. You know, Brandy's feedback and some of the suggestions that I've had through the, the things that I've through it and uh, ethics to me like I didn't understand any of this when I started out. I didn't understand how how did you apply for money? How did you decide you wanted to do this research in the first place? How do you how do you do any of it? Where does a funding come from? Who are the funding agencies? So when a patient partner comes into your organization or into your team, you have got to remember that that we're starting with a blank slate. And if somebody, you really need somebody to kind of take hold of your patient partner and be that person for them so that when they're walking through the process, they have someone to go back to all the time when they're feeling intimidated. So this has been an amazing, uh, um, an amazing experience for me working with this group. Thank you, Thank you so really. much, Marie. Sorry. I don't know if I'm jumping in too early, Bob, do you have one nope. more? Yeah, we just had one more slide where we finally got to our key point, which, uh, <laughs> you know, good, good researcher that I am talking too much um, which is which is great but yeah really our key sort of takeaways for why patient-oriented research matters and and really from the researcher side it's about relevance you're you're asking questions that matter to people it's about accountability as i mentioned our, our relationships are what lift us up and keep us on track and of course dissemination right engagement uptake and meaningful resources which returns us to that relevance piece and of course marie had communication, courage, and community there. And I'll let her speak to those. And then we're Essentially, done. I talked about communication, courage, even the smallest thing. When you're working with a bunch of doctors in the room, doctors, you know, uh, uh, let them know. You don't have to call me Dr. Fornsler through the the, the the period of time. You know, this is a formally very informal chat. We want to make the best, get the best from everyone. And then, of course, getting involved and joining research efforts as a patient partner it is huge. We're, we become part of the community and part of the solution. So, it's a big deal. Thank you so much, Dr. Bob Bornsler and me, Marie Adjuritas, our patient partner. Thank you again for sharing those stories. So if people do have questions, pop them in the chat, but perhaps I can sort of mirror one of the questions that came for, for Sarah and um, Elizabeth before is, Bob, do you have any advice for researchers that are trying to connect with diverse communities that might be hard to reach? Like, do you have any advice, advice for that recruitment? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I think, uh, one of the biggest barriers I see is is fear from from researchers. You know, we're very well trained in in our methods and in our our study design and these things. But one of the skills that often isn't emphasized, at least in training, is is speaking to people. Um, you know, sharing ourselves, introducing ourselves, and what we do. Uh, it's amazing to me how just you know sort of saying, "Hey, I work in substance use research." Um, people will will come up and say, "Oh, you know." I have this question or I have this friend or, or there's, there's often a story. And so your willingness to hear those stories, to take that time uh, to listen and, and just to be curious about uh, the people in the community around you is really important. Um, I really suggest if you are a researcher seeking, uh, seeking patient partners, yes, follow up with Skipper, absolutely 100%. Um, but don't be afraid to get a little bit creative, you know, even something like a, a YouTube video being like, hi, uh, many people call me Dr. Fornsler, but I prefer Barb, um, blah, 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 you know, and just sort of sharing a little bit about yourself. Um, you know, I find, frankly, many people uh, are much more interested in talking about my, my Great Dane than they are uh, often talking about my research design. You know, shockingly, it's uh, more relevant to their lives and, and it's something that they can connect with. So don't be afraid to share who you are outside of your credentials with, with the community that surrounds you. Yeah, that's really important. I'm um, just sharing some comments from the chat for you both. Um, thank you for sharing meaningful work in this area of substance misuse and addiction. I was truly touched to hear about your family experience, Marie, and your strength to bring about change through patient-centered research. Um, yeah, lots of um, thank you for sharing. Um, maybe a, a quick last question to Marie. Do you have any advice for patient partners or patient family partners that are working with research teams? 
Well, find, again, ask on the onset, say, I really need somebody that can kind of act as my ambassador on the team so that you've got a single connection because that's easy to lose. The connection is easy to lose. We, in this last year of COVID, with working on some teams, um, it backed everything up. Everybody was really, really busy and patient partner would get lost in that translation. And the other thing too, is as a patient partner, if you're interested or know somebody who you know would be a really valuable patient partner on a research team, substance use, kidneys, whatever it is in the community, go to uh, the Skipper website, look under, if you go into resources, you're gonna find the patient and researcher connection site. I'm looking at my computer right here. And there's an opportunity for you to sign up as a patient partner and an opportunity then for researchers to go in and say, hey, is there anybody out there looking for an opportunity to be part of our research team? It's a great place to start. So make sure you use Skipper as a resource. Uh, it's, they're quite amazing, I guess. Just a little plug for you, Michelle. <laughs> Thanks, Marie. That's perfect. I promise I didn't pay you to say that. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Yeah, I, I often get emails from people who say, please, I want to introduce you to my friend who's interested in research and we'll have a chat. I want to hear what people want to get involved in because that's mm -hmm. what I do is connect people. So thank you so much. Yeah, lots of more, more thank you. Amazing work in the chats. And thanks for all that practical advice for the benefits of using this approach to research. So I guess with that, um, I guess I'd like to thank all of our speakers today, both Dr. Donkers and Dr. Thornsler and to our wonderful patients, Elizabeth and Marie. Thank you very much for your stories and for your time. And I want to thank the audience too. Thank you all for attending today's sessions. Um, so we'll hope to see you again. We still have some more presentations today and tomorrow, day two of the 2021 Research Showcase. Hope you had a fantastic time and um, experienced this seamless platform that we're using today with Feedloop. There'll be a short survey that's going to be sent out to everybody just regarding um, Feedloop and the experiences. We really do appreciate your feedback. We use that to make sure that we're continuing to improve and do better for future presentations and for future research showcase events. So the platform is actually open 24 seven to explore. You can have a look at the posters and I'll see what other presentations are coming up. Um, and if you do have any support questions, they're available while the program is running during the day. So if you've got um, questions about the platform, please reach out to research showcase at the UKSA.com for any questions. Anyway, um, thank you very much for your time, everybody. And I hope you have a wonderful afternoon.